It's my great joy and privilege to speak to you the things of God. And I do so in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. When Christians gather Sunday by Sunday, we essentially do two things. First is that we gather around an altar, a table, and celebrate the Eucharist and are fed and nurtured by this holy sacrament, the body and blood of Christ. The other thing we do Sunday by Sunday is we learn to be still. We learn to be silent. We listen. We listen to the reading of scripture. And those two things, the listening to the reading of scripture and the celebration of the Eucharist tell us who we are and what we're about. And it's the second of these that I want to share some things with you, some thoughts with you this morning. Incidentally, did you know that scripture was written to be read and to be read aloud and to be read aloud in community? It was always written to a community and to be read to that community. It's more a thing of the ear than it is of the eye. Even though when we think of reading the Bible, we may think of a group sitting around a table, as we do in conversation Sunday by Sunday, reflecting on scripture. Or we may think of a quiet moment before bedtime when someone's reading a verse from scripture to hopefully have a more sound sleep. But essentially, scripture was written to be read, read to a community, and read aloud. And that's what we do Sunday by Sunday. And incidentally, I hope the rector will forgive me for saying this, but very often when uh, the reader has finished reading the particular text, he or she will say, hear what the scripture is saying, what God, the spirit is saying to the churches. Hear what the spirit is saying to the churches. And we respond as we do now, thanks be to God. And to be honest, I prefer this second response because it suggests when it says, hear what the scripture, what the spirit is saying to the churches. It's saying, listen up, folks. Hear. Listen. Tune your ears to hear. And when he, go, when he or she goes on to say what the Spirit is saying to the churches, it is saying that this text has a direction. It's going somewhere. It's saying something. God is speaking to us here and now in this place, and we need to listen. And frankly, I think for many folks, that's a problem. And if it isn't a problem for you, don't let me say anything that will make it a problem for you. But at least for lots of folks, it's a problem. And the problem is essentially this. The scriptures we hear Sunday by Sunday were written centuries ago to a people with a worldview very different from ours and to people in many ways different from us. And when these ancient texts are read in this place in this 21st century, they are read in the midst of our world in which we hear about controversies and discussions and debates and news reports about Aboriginal poverty and social ills, about assisted death and climate change, about pipelines and same-sex unions and international trade agreements and Aleppo and apparently endless wars about selling military equipment to questionable folks. It's about loss of jobs 
And when we hear those ancient texts being read into our world, of all those things happening in the world that we become so familiar with, we wonder if they relate somehow to the world that we know. When it, I find it interesting then when we hear about Aleppo or the hundreds of thousands of refugees who are fleeing violence and warfare and poverty and racism to find a better place for themselves and their children. We hear about that in the very next instant in the news reports. We see a beautiful young lady telling us how wonderful the underarm deodorant she's selling it is. When we hear about mass shootings in Texas or a suicide bomb blowing up and killing 30 people, then the next instant we'll hear about some chubby, rotund young man telling us about the wonders of hormone-free hamburgers. And we wonder when any of these ancient texts can relate to the world that we know. Not surprisingly, it seems to be, when we hear those ancient texts, we wonder if they can relate. And not only that, we wonder, we worry about those texts sometimes. We worry when we hear about the creation of the world, the story of the creation in Genesis, we wonder. We wonder if that can stand up. Can that stand up in our world deeply embedded in scientific knowledge and technological wonders? When we hear texts written about primitive early Israelite religion, we wonder if that will stand up in our age. And so we question, and we find it difficult to hear. And I think sometimes our eagerness to be modern suggests to many folks that we're prevented from really listening to those ancient texts. But our 21st century world of science and technology just prevents us from really hearing those texts. So I say this with some difficulty because I want to say, let's look very briefly at what the scriptures are and what they're not. I, re I realize I can't begin to be fair to this subject in this short time, but I'll, I'll try to say something hopefully reasonably helpful. Some Christians, and I'm not one of them, but there are many in our time, who believe that the scriptures were written entirely by God. They set forth absolute truths about theology, about ethics. And when they say the world was created in six days, they would say it was. And if the scriptures say that Noah took a pair of every animal in the world onto, into his ark, he did. And that to question scripture is to be unfaithful and even unchristian. There are others, and I would include myself in this group, there are others who believe that just as the Eucharist, this sacrament is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace, so also is the listening to the word of God an audible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. And the scriptures I think, are the long, long story of God's unrelating, unrelenting faithfulness to the human community in reaching out through centuries and speaking through fallible men and women like us 
It's the story of God's unfailing faithfulness in reaching out to the human community and inviting them to live in a new and life-giving relationship. And those scriptures are the story, especially of God working through Jesus, through his life and death and resurrection, and through the gift of the Spirit to bring us and to invite us to a new relationship with God, with our world, and with one another. The scriptures we read this morning, in those scriptures was an invitation, an invitation to join in that relationship and find meaning and purpose for our life as we do. May I suggest that when we hear scripture read, read, read Sunday by Sunday, we ask three simple, basic questions. When you hear the story, as we did in the Gospel this morning, of Zacchaeus, the first question we might ask is, what is God doing in this particular text? What is God up to when we listen to that text? Where is God in that text? What does that reading tell us about God? And when we've dealt with those questions, what is this text telling us about God? What is God up to in this text? Then the third question is, what is God saying to us now, here in St. Matthew's Church? What does that story of Zacchaeus say to us now? What is God saying to us in this place, at this time, in this parish, about our life? I think instead of seeing scriptures or hearing scriptures as simply a problem, a difficulty, perhaps we might wrestle with those questions and discern something of God's purposes. Sometimes, though, scripture texts are very difficult, and it's difficult to find meaning in them. Now, when I thought of that, I was thinking of that comic character that some of you may remember. Remember Waldo, who was a funny little man in, I think, a red and white uh, sweater who wanders endlessly into all kinds of uh, fantastic, endless relationships, and you often see him lost in a whole crowd of animals and people and clouds and who knows what. And the fun for children is to find Waldo in that mass of people and clowns and animals. Well, sometimes when I come to a difficult text, I think of Waldo. And I wrestle with, where do I find Waldo in that text? How do I find what God is saying to us in that text? But when we are attentive, when we struggle with a text, we will discover that every text has a direction, it has a trajectory. And almost always the trajectory is directed towards us now. And it almost always ends with an invitation. It's not nearly so much about disseminating information about God or Jesus or anybody else. It's essentially, it's an invitation. It has a trajectory, and the trajectory is almost directed always towards us and our response. And it invites us into a different world. It invites us into a new relationship in which we see the world around us differently. And we will be a different people 
because we hear the text of scripture. But when we do hear scripture, we may in fact learn something about Jesus, we may in fact learn something about God, but very often as we do, the text will disturb us. Sometimes it will shake us. There are times it may even annoy us. It may unsettle us. It may offer some discomfort to us. Sometimes the words of the texts that we hear, the thoughts and words of that text may literally ricochet off the walls of this church. So every Sunday, we come to this place, we celebrate the Eucharist, we are fed and nurtured by the body and blood of Christ, we are silent and we listen, and we learn something more of ourselves and who we are. We respond to God's invitation, and then we leave this place with the blessing of God ringing in our ears as we move out to live a new way with our new understanding of the world around us. I don't know whether anybody ever reads Susan Howitch anymore, but uh, in one of her books, she uh, relates a story of uh, Church of England Archdeacon who was thoroughly scolded at one time by his sister. She accuses him of being preoccupied with his success. And she says this, you and your prizes, the only prize worth winning is love. And just you remember that when you're a lonely old man trying to comfort yourself with your bank balance and your fading memories. And the archdeacon then later reflects on what his sister has said to him as he sits in this grand house where he lives and he says this, I look around at all the mementos of my past, all my prizes, and I think, what a great success I was. But after a while, I begin to hear that silence, that long, long silence. And I know what it, with a terrible certainty that the only prize worth chasing is the prize I managed to lose. And I think when we listen to the words of scripture read to us, those words probe our life, they challenge us, they invite us to consider what is the prize that we are pursuing? What is the prize worth chasing? The scriptures are an invitation to our life. And I think if we are attentive to scripture, if we are really prepared to wrestle with it and listen to it and hear the voice of God in it, we may well have the experience that Jacob has. A lovely story in the book of Genesis where you remember Jacob is out in the wilderness and he lies down and he puts his head against a stone and uses that stone as a pillow and he falls asleep. And in the middle of the night he has this wonderful dream of God reaching out. And when he wakes up in the morning, he says these marvelous words, which I think would well apply to us as we hear the words of scripture given to us, the life-giving words of God speaking to us. Jacob says, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. How awesome is this place. This is no other 
in the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. Hear God. 